Good morning and welcome to our main Bible reading and sermon for this Sunday, March the 12th, 2023. I hope you've not been too restricted by the snow this last week. Well, in a moment, we're going to be coming to look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. But before we do, I want to uh, put a little picture in your mind. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, we meet a man who was the treasurer to the Queen of Ethiopia. The treasurer to the Queen of Ethiopia. And yet he had travelled to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, it's estimated that it would have taken him five months each way. Five months each way to travel to the temple in Jerusalem to worship uh, the God he who worshipped. To come, to come close to him, not into his presence because he couldn't in those days. You were shut out from the Holy Holies, everyone was. And, and as someone who wasn't a Jew himself, but who worshipped uh, the Jewish God, he wasn't even allowed in the, in the normal temple courts. So he had to go to the special outer Gentile temple courts. They'd been set aside there for people from all the whole world to come and pray to God, coming close to him, praying to him in his temple. And so as he arrived there, he would have been oh, so looking forward to praying to God, coming to a place of prayer. And he would have gone into those Gentile temple courts to pray. And what would he have encountered? Would he have encountered people the sound of prayer? Well, sadly, no. No, he would have gone in and heard this. Meh. You see, in Jesus' day, the Israelites had turned those prayers as courts for prayer, for Gentile prayer, into a marketplace. That's what we're going to encounter today. That's what Jesus encounters. And we'll see what Jesus thinks about that and some of the revolutionary response he gave to it. So if you could get your Bible, turn to John chapter 2. And I'll begin reading from verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple courts. He found people there selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and he drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers. He overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to Jesus, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as we look a little closer at those words, you keep them open. Let's pray. Lord, you do not speak in vain. Your word does its work in some hearts, bearing fruit in others, prompting rejection. Lord, may you help our hearts to be good soil. Show us more of your wonder, we pray today. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, today in this passage, we'll see that Jesus opens the inaccessible for all who come to him. Jesus opens the inaccessible for all who come to him. Firstly, then, Jesus opens the inaccessible. Now, I want you to, to think back to the sadness and the solemnity of last autumn of the death of Queen Elizabeth II. After uh, a short while in Scotland, her body was taken down to lay in state in Westminster. And there was the opportunity for people to go and view the coffin. Not to go too close, but to be to stand at a distance. But thousands and thousands of people did that. 
After a, a long journey to London, they would then queue up for up to 35 hours to get in. And then, well, you could only stand at a distance. There was no access for us to the Queen's resting place. Well, for the Jerusalem Temple, it was something a little bit similar. Once you got there, you couldn't access the inner Holy of Holies, where God symbolically dwelt. There was no access there because of some issues we'll talk about later. But still, people did come close. They came close. They were called to come close uh, to God. And as I said, they travelled for up to five months each way. And for believers who weren't Jewish, well, all they could, they could only use the outside Gentile, court, Gentile courts to pray. And as we'd read from our reading there, these had been hijacked into being a temple market. Not a quiet place of solemn prayer to the Almighty God, but a, a market. And of course, there were some very good reasons behind this. Firstly, the, the Jews said, well, God deserves unadulterated pure gifts, not the watered-down alloys and shaved edges of Roman coinage. So there needs to be somewhere to change from Roman money to temple currency. Well, it had to happen somewhere, didn't it? Oh, and then there was the, the market for animals to bring in sacrifice. To save people having to carry the animals for hundreds of miles uh, and then sacrifice them, they said, well, they could sell them there, change the money, and then come here and buy them there and then, then sacrifice the ones they'd bought. So we're doing it to help people to worship, but we need somewhere to have the market. Ah, and of course it was no bad thing that the market made money to maintain the temple and keep its leaders well paid. It all made sense, and the most obvious area of the temple court was the court of the Gentiles. After all, the, the Israelites were the, the locals who mattered. This was their temple, first and foremost. And so there was a clear logic, but it failed to consider how the results fitted with God's priorities. With God's priorities. Was God really more concerned with the details of sacrifice or with the prayer from the people of, with prayer from the, people of the whole world? Was the temple a market? Or a house to meet with God? Did money and rules matter more than a relationship with God? Jesus was very clear with his answer. The system had taken over the court of the Gentiles. So they no longer had a place of prayer. They could travel for months and months and not have anywhere to encounter God in prayer. The system aimed at making God partially accessible had, for the Gentiles at least, made him inaccessible. So, knowing that everyone else there present had a vested interest in the status quo, Jesus resorted to violent action to get change. For sometimes only a shock to the system can challenge the system. And by wrecking the joint, as Jesus metaphorically and literally did to some extent, Jesus opens the inaccessible. He stands for those who had no voice that they may have access to God too, in some sense there. Now non-Jews had a special prayer, place of prayer once again available to them. Jesus helped the world by making a stand for the 98% of people who had no voice. Now, Jesus turning the tables of the money changes over would have made the headlines. But that's not the most revolutionary part of this passage. That act was like uh, Jesus... Uh, sticking, putting a sticking plaster on a short-term patch on an open wound. Because Jesus also, in this passage, sounded the death knell for the Jerusalem temple and all that surrounds it. He started the revolution that would not just help the world, but would change the world. For secondly, Jesus opens the inaccessible for all who come to him. Jesus opens the inaccessible. For all who come to him. The key verse here is verse 21. But the temple Jesus had spoken of was his body. His body. Here Jesus was in the Jerusalem temple where people came to meet God at a distance. And Jesus spoke of a temple being destroyed and him raising it in three days. And understandably his listeners assumed he meant the Jerusalem temple. And rebuilding this vast building which had taken decades to build would have been basically impossible, humanly speaking. But Jesus wasn't speaking about the building. Jesus was speaking about his own body. 
his body that will be destroyed by crucifixion and miraculously raised in resurrection on the third day. So how is Jesus' body a temple, the temple? Because Jesus was God, God came to dwell in a human. So when we meet Jesus, we meet God. Until then, God had been inaccessible to ordinary humans because our sins couldn't stand his holiness. God sectioned himself off away in the temple, not to avoid the stain of our sin, but to protect us from what would happen to us should we encounter his true holiness. The temple sacrifices were symbolic of the death needed for access to God. Those sheep, doves killed to show that death was needed. Sin deserved death. They were a shadow and Jesus was the reality they anticipated. Jesus the Lamb of God. For Jesus came to actually deal with our sin, to take its punishment on himself, so that we could not just uh, care its distance from God, but approach him without the result being our death, because our sins were forgiven and taken away. Jesus opens the inaccessible for all who come to him. Jesus is the true temple. He's the place that we can properly meet God, and he was the perfect once-for-all sacrifice for us, so that we can meet God and know him forever. And that's why our Christian churches have neither altars nor sacrifices. Instead we have communion tables for family meals and gifts given in thanks. It's not what we've got to give to God to get in his good books, it's what God gives to us in Jesus. God is close in Jesus. And to make God's ar God arm's length again is to rip the heart out of what Jesus died for. That's why the Reformers and Protestant Christians are so keen not to call our communion tables altars, because they're not. God didn't make us for a clean-yourself-up-and-then-stand-at-a-distance religion. God himself came to us, meeting us as we are, where we are, and then helping transform us all to, to all we can be in Jesus. This is what the disciples delighted in when they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken, that Jesus opens the inaccessible for all who come to him. For you, whatever you like, and for me, in the state that I'm in. His words, Jesus' words, are God's words. They are like scripture. We see simply to believe. So then, let's act on that belief now and come into the presence of God forever, because we can through Jesus. We don't need to go anywhere for that. We can do it right now. So let's pray, because God is listening. O oh, Father God, we praise you for Jesus' courage in exposing a corrupt system and in standing up for those without a voice. Help us to do the same. But more than that, Lord, we praise you that Jesus came so that we and everyone freely can meet you, know you, and dwell with you forever. Lord, dwell in us by your Holy Spirit now. Increase our delight in you, Lord. Help us to long for others and work for others this week to come to know you, to meet you. Help us, Lord, to come in with joy and will help others to do the same. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.